All right, well, this is our fifth Sunday, which is our family Sunday, so we've got our elementary kids in here to worship with us this morning so they, too, can just experience what it's like um, for us as adults to worship, experience big church. Now, parents, um, those of you that are parents, even grandparents, just want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever had a nightmare, one of those bad dreams about your kid, and you woke up in the middle of the night and you ran down to the bedroom just to make sure they were okay? How many of you ever had one of those Okay, we've all kind of, maybe as much of us had one of those nightmares. Now, how many of you ever had a daymare? You know what I'm talking about? A daymare, you know what a daymare is? A daymare is, is like maybe you're out, maybe your mom, you're out pushing the stroller, you got your kid, you know, you're going for a walk in a neighborhood, and all of a sudden you start having these crazy thoughts. What if this wild dog just started running towards us, you know, you know, and you just have this imagination going on of what's going to happen, and you're just kind of playing it all out, and all of a sudden you go from normal, boring mom to ninja mom. Right? You're thinking what you're going to do when that dog comes, right? How many of you have ever done that? You ever had a daymare? All right. See, I'm not the only weird person here. I'm just glad to know that. I mean, because you, know, you sit there and think through, what if some crazy scenario were to happen? Am I going to be ready for it? Now, what if you knew what was going to take place in the future for your kids? What would you do different? And that's what we're going to be Excuse me, that's what we'll be looking at today as we're wrapping up our series in the book of Daniel. And we're going to be talking about standing in faith for the future. Standing in faith for the future. Now, we, last time we met, last week, we were in Daniel chapter 6. All right, there's 12 chapters in the book of Daniel, and so we're wrapping it up today. So I'm going to summarize the next six chapters. It might take us a couple hours, but I'm going to get us through the next six chapters. Are you guys ready? All right, I'm going to summarize a little bit. So just so you know, chapter 7 and chapter 8 actually are placed chronologically before two weeks ago, all right, when King Belshazzar was the king, all right? So before, I guess, was chapter 5 took place um, is when those there's a couple visions that Daniel had. Some of them included Belshazzar, okay, this Daniel didn't serve Belshazzar. He was called in at the end. Remember, we talked about the handwriting on the wall. Okay, so those visions took place. They were visions about the end time. The rest of Daniel is about future events, visions of things to come. All right? So, so, so chapter um, 8 and 9, or 7 and 8 have to do with that. Chapter 9 picks up, and Daniel, somehow, I'm not really sure, but Daniel got a hold of the book, the scrolls of the book of Jeremiah. Now, we've talked about this through this series, that Jeremiah was a contemporary of Daniel's, okay? He was a prophet alive during the time of Daniel, but he was older than Daniel, so he's probably not alive at this point in time. He's probably passed on, but he was a prophet to God's people, and Daniel got a hold of the scrolls that he had written down of the book of Jeremiah, and as he's reading it, he remembers and he realizes that he was going to be, his people were going to be in captivity for 70 years. Remember, we talked about this. Now, here's the cool thing, kids. You need to listen up to this. Daniel, you know how old Daniel was when he was taken away? Daniel was taken away from his family to a whole other country around 15 years old. Now, could you imagine it being a 15-year-old kid? That's only a couple years away for some of you. Some of you are probably going to 20, right, parents? And, and, you know, he's 15 years old. He's taken away 1,500 miles away from his homeland. And yet Daniel lived such an incredible life before God and living his life for God that he and his three other companions, we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stood out and they changed the world. They changed the minds of the greatest kings where those kings acknowledged the Lord God as the one true God. Okay, so, so Daniel, he's reading the scroll of the book of Jeremiah and he realizes he was taken away at the age of 15. Now he's somewhere like 84, maybe 86. He's in his mid to late 80s, okay? And he's realizing that that 70-year window is coming to a close. And so in chapter 9, we see Daniel, what does he do? He gets down and he begins to pray. And he begins to pray not for himself, because he knew he wasn't going to make that trek back to Jerusalem. But he knew that the prophet Isaiah, who was before him, somewhere close to maybe 100 years before him, this is, check this out. Daniel was serving, which king is he serving? You guys remember? King Cyrus, all right? He's serving Cyrus at this point in time, all right? Isaiah the prophet prophesied that, that there would be a leader, a king, that God would use as an instrument to rebuild his temple by the name of Cyrus. 
All right, so there's this amazing Old Testament prophecy that comes fulfilled. So Daniel, he's, he's got all this stuff. Remember we talked about how he was well-trained. His parents taught him well. He learned the word of God. He knew who God was. And he's thinking, no, realizing that this time this window is coming to an end. So he begins to pray. God answers his prayer. Cyrus lets a whole remnant of people go back to Jerusalem, and they start rebuilding the temple. All right, the temple of Solomon that was destroyed, they start rebuilding the temple. Now, how many of you have read the book of Ezra? Okay, this is Ezra. Okay, Ezra and a group of people are going back and they're starting to rebuild the temple. Unfortunately, all the neighboring, you know, countries by, you know, Israel did not like the fact they were rebuilding it. So they, they just started causing all kinds of trouble and the building of the temple came to a halt. Now we pick up, we're going to look at chapter 10 today, and really the rest of, from chapter 10 to chapter 12 is the rest of just one continuous vision and revelation of things to come. Things that have already taken place, they were Daniel's future, and things that are still to take place in the future. All right, so we're going to pick up in Daniel chapter 10, I'm just going to jump in here, verse 1, this is what it says. It says, in the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, now remember we talked about that, Nebuchadnezzar gave him a different name in honor of his idol god, and so he was known to the Babylonians as Belteshazzar, but his name is Daniel, that's his Jewish Hebrew name, um, had another vision. He understood that the vision concerned events certain to happen when? In the future, okay? Now what kind of vision was this? All right, it says here, these this things that he's seen were times of war and great hardship. All right, now I don't know about you, but if I have this vision, I have this dream, I have this nightmare in the middle of the night, I'm, you know, it's going to trouble me. Because you see things that's going to happen, and we're going to see that these, these things of, great, of war and hardship had to do with the people of God, his very people, in the ends of times. And so Daniel is greatly troubled by this vision that he has, and he is moved. And we're going to see and learn today just four things on how Daniel stood in faith for the future. So we're just going to four simple things. The first thing, number one, we can learn from Daniel, and Daniel chapter 10 is this. We need to have a burden for the things of God. We need to have a burden for the things of God. Daniel, when he read the scroll in chapter 9 of, of, of Jeremiah, realizing the 70-year window is coming to an end, he's thinking about not himself, but the next generation after him. Some of these young kids that are sitting in this room right now, he's thinking about that generation, and he begins to pray hard for them that were going back, that remnant that were going back to rebuild the temple. Because rebuilding the temple meant that God would be honored once again. His name would be proclaimed throughout the earth. The glory of the temple, the glory of God would be honored throughout the world. And so Daniel has this incredible burden for the things of God and wanting to see those things take place and those things fulfilled. Verse 2, this is what it says. It says, when this vision came to me, I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three whole weeks. All the time I had eaten no rich food, no meat or wine crossed my lips, and I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. Well, what does that mean? Okay, we're going to learn here what, what Daniel's doing during this time when he finds out that this work on the temple, they're rebuilding the temple, it comes to a halt. He just has this incredible burden. And so he, he just decides he's going to do what we've learned in this series is a Daniel fast, okay, which he's not going to eat any meat. He's not drinking the king's wine, all the delicacies. He only ate what was according to the Old Testament law, what was kosher, but he just decided he was going to eat nothing but vegetables, all right, fruit and vegetables. That's what he's going to do. No meat, none of that stuff. And he just goes into a period of mourning, on his knees, humbling himself before God, crying out to God for his people, for this generation, this next generation, and what was going to come, that, that God would, would restart that work. He let him go back, that it wouldn't come to an end, that God's name would be honored. And so he just comes to this three-week period of fasting and prayer and mourning. And where it says here that he used no fragrant lotions, that means that he smelled really bad. You ever smell really bad? So, so just kind of let you know, we talked about, you know, being part of, you know, he's a right-hand guy of King Cyrus at this time. Even though he's, he's really old, um, King Cyrus promoted him. And, and so th those that were in that elite class had access to fragrance, lotions, and they would often put them on so they would smell really good and fresh and everything. And Daniel decided he wasn't going to partake in any of that. He was going to go into a period of mourning. 
just in complete brokenness before God because his heart was broken over the things of God and his people. And I think as, as a people of God, as, as a church, we need to ask God to give us a burden, a burden for this generation, a burden for these young people that are here with us this morning. Because I'm telling you, this generation is experiencing things that we never experienced growing up. I didn't experience. They're being bombarded. You've heard me talk about this. We're being bombarded with all kinds of information. I mean, we live in a crazy world. I know that we hear more and more about crazy things. Even this past week, there's just crazy things that go on in and around our community. I mean, just so many things. Drugs are out of control. Information. And there's just this crazy stuff. And so we need to just get on our knees and, and have a burden for the things of God and for this next generation and what God would do through them. You know, some of the greatest changes in world history weren't accomplished in a position of great leaders. They were accomplished on the knees of men and women of God who prayed and fasted for their generation and the generation after them. Slavery was abolished in, in nations because of men and women who got on their hands and knees and prayed and fasted and asked God to break that curse on their people and on their generation. Kingdoms have changed because of men and women. The greatest battles have been won by people that have had a burden for God. And we need to have a burden for the things of God. The second thing, number two, we can learn from Daniel is we need to have a clear vision of God. And I think one of the challenges we have today and this generation is there's so much information, it's really uncertain what God is really like. There's just a lot of uncertainty. And so our, our kids are being bombarded out in the schools. When we send them off to college, these professors, you've heard me say this, they've got agendas. I've watched videos. I've heard them say these things. They've got agendas. They want to change our kids' minds. And there's just a lot of confusion on who God is and what God is like. I mean, I remember growing up, I used to think God was this, this gray hair, you know, like Santa Claus, gray hair, you know, white hair and a big old beard. And he was just a big, mean dude just waiting to bust me for every wrong thing I did. Anybody ever have a picture like that in your mind? You know, so I was, I was scared to death of God. You know, it's like, oh, I better not do this, I better not do that. Because I never saw him as this loving, gracious, good, good father as we just sang about. And it's important that we learn to have a clear vision of God and we teach our kids to have a clear vision of who God is and what God is like. And so I would just ask you a question, what is the focus of your life? Because the things that we focus on, are, are we just focused on the things that we're going to do in this world, the things we're going to accomplish, the things we're going to have, all the things, all the toys, you know, because it's a rat race and if we can just win in the end, we got enough toys, you know, to beat the next person, have more than the Jones next to us. And in the end, what? If we just have a bunch of junk. Really, what is the focus of our lives? Because I really believe God wants us to have a bigger vision and clearly understanding who he is. So we go on. Verse 5, it picks up here in this story as this vision goes on. He says, I looked up and I saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like a precious gem. His face flashed like lightning and his eyes flamed like torches. His arms and feet shone like polished bronze and his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. Let's just hold pause here for a second. Now, could you imagine this incredible vision? Now, when you read the book of Revelation, you will see that what Daniel is describing here is a very similar, almost exact wording of the description of the person of Jesus Christ in his glory and eternity. All right? Some scholars suggest that this is possibly Jesus. Others say it's just an angelic being. Either way, it's a clear vision of the glory of God and who he is and what he's like and his radiance and all of his glory. That we have an awesome God. As, as I read in that, that prayer that Daniel prayed earlier when we first started, we have an awesome God. And that goes on, verse 7. It says, only I, Daniel, saw this vision. The men with me saw nothing, but they were suddenly terrified and ran away to hide. So I was left there all alone to see this amazing vision. So at this point in time, Daniel is standing beside this river, the Tigris River. And as he's standing beside this river, you know, in, in this vision that he's having, there's these other guys with him. They didn't see it. They completely missed it. They had no vision, no clear understanding of who God was or what God was like. So what did they do? They ran away and hid. Now, I believe sometimes God purposely does things in our lives to give us a clear vision of who he is and what he wants to do in and through our lives. And only us, only you understand that thing because God's given you that clear vision. 
of who he is and what he's like and what he wants to do in and through. Daniel was the only one who saw this vision. And I really think that Daniel had a supernatural vision of God because Daniel had a burden for the things of God and he longed for the things of God. And because he had a clear vision of who God was, God revealed to him some of the most incredible things, revelatory stuff. Many scholars debate whether or not the book of Daniel is really authentic, whether it was really written during the time of Daniel or not. Because so many of his prophecies have been so accurate. Seeing the kingdom of, after the, the, he saw that, you know, when he had the dream, remember we talked about when Nebuchadnezzar had this dream and he didn't want anybody to tell him the interpretation. He wanted them to tell him what the dream was and then the interpretation. And it was a dream about the statue with the head of gold and then the, the silver and the bronze and the iron and that mixed with iron and clay. And it was about the future kingdoms to come, the Medes and the Persians who then defeated Babylon and then the Greeks under Alexander the Great. There's extensive prophecy in some of these chapters um, when Alexander the Great died, there were four of the leaders that took over, and then there's a small horn that raises up another leader and starts doing just wicked stuff. And then after that, the Romans come, the iron, and, and then the whole Roman Empire, and he had a vision in chapter 9 of the Messiah coming. And there's a number of days, 400 and some days later, or years later, was when the Messiah comes. And Jesus came that many years right after his crucifixion took place. I mean, it was so incredibly accurate all those things that took place after Daniel, and some of them haven't taken place yet today. All right, so there's just incredible accuracy in here. But a number of scholars, there's just so much evidence to show that Daniel wrote this, and it was right during the time that it says when Daniel and Jeremiah and these other prophets were alive. And just incredible accuracy, and Daniel was showing these things because he clearly understood who the Lord God was. And so in our time of worship, you know, we want our kids just to experience just the fullness and the glory of our God, this God that is so worthy of praise. So we need to have a burden for the things of God. We need to have a clear vision of God. The third thing, number three, is this, is simply to understand God's vision for you. That God has a vision specifically for you. You are not here by accident. God puts you here. He puts you in the family that you're in. And he's got your name. He's got you numbered. He knows everything about your life. And God has a clear vision for you. So we're going to go on and see this, in this vision what was revealed to Daniel. Verse, going back to verse 8, the second part of verse 8. It says this. He says, my strength left me. My face grew deathly pale, and I felt very weak. Then I heard the man speak. And when I heard the sound of his voice, I fainted and lay there with my face to the ground. So this is one of those experiences, like we're, we were just singing, you know, Holy Spirit, we long for your presence. Just that there's this overwhelming presence. I mean, Daniel, he's there fasting, praying before God. He has this vision, and he's just, he's just feeling the presence of God to where he just falls completely in weakness before God. You ever experience one of those moments? And, and God just wants us to experience him. Verse 10 picks up. It says, just then a hand touched me and lifted me. Still trembling to my hands and knees, and the man said to me, Daniel, you are very precious to God. I really believe some of you need to hear that this morning. That God wants you to know that you are very precious to him. The whole focus of scripture is God's incredible heart towards his creation, towards us. We're the apple of his eye. We are the focus of his love, the focus of his attention. He pursued us with everything he got to, he has through the person of Jesus Christ, coming and dying for us while we were still sinners. He poured out his life on a Roman cross, conquering sin and then death as he rose from the grave. And God told Daniel, he says, Daniel, you are very precious to God. And he says, so listen, listen carefully to what I have to stay, say to you. And then he doesn't leave him down there, he says, stand up. For I have been sent to you, and when he said this to me, I stood up still trembling. And I really believe we see in this context here and throughout chapter 12 that there's a time and a place for us to be on our knees and fasting and praying and mourning for the things of God and the things of his kingdom. And then it comes to the place where God says, look, it's time to stand. It's time to take a stand. It's time to stand attention to his words. And that's why it's so important that we get into God's word and we get it into our lives. That's where we're committed as a church to investing in these young kids and their lives and, and teaching them the word of God. And through all of the, the creative stuff that we've got going on back there in those classrooms. And with our young adults 
investing in them, in this generation. We want them to know the word of God, to tremble before the presence of God and before the word of God. God wants to restore us. He wants us to stand at attention. He wants us to know that we are precious to him. And God has a vision for us and for our lives and what he wants to do in us and through us. Now, years ago, about 30-some years ago, before I began, um, went into full-time ministry, I had a dream very similar to what Daniel had. And it was really, you might call it a night vision, all right? It wasn't a nightmare. It was a night vision. And, and similar to Daniel's story, this is a true story. I know I tell a bunch of stupid stuff a lot of times, but this is true, all right? And so, so I was in this dream, I was standing on a riverbank, all right? And it was in these, like these hills, and I'm standing on this riverbank, and as I look upstream, I know some of you are thinking, yeah, you were thinking about fishing. I wish that would have been the dream, but I wasn't, okay? So I'm standing on a riverbank, and there's this person coming downstream, and they're fighting for their life. They're struggling. They're, they're drowning, and, and, they, and they can't get out of the current that's pulling them downstream. And in that moment, as I'm, I'm getting ready to move into action, all of a sudden, this beast comes up out of the water, this huge beast comes up and it just disrupts the water and it overtakes this person and the beast goes forth out away from me into the world and I knew it was going out to conquer and destroy. And then in that moment, right after that, this red horse comes up out of the water and then a white horse comes up out of the water and goes forth. Now in my mind, because I know I've read scripture, I'm thinking, you know, God's just showing me stuff that's going on out in the world, that we are in the middle of a battle. We're in the middle of a war. And in this moment, as I'm watching this person struggling, all of a sudden I'm lifted up onto this high rock looking down at this stream and this person's fighting for their life. And then immediately this person appears next to me. All right, And it was a person that, that represented wickedness to me. It was a person that I knew practiced witchcraft, All right, that I knew personally. And this person is standing next to me, and they look at me, and they say, look, you can't do anything about it. And in that moment, I was just stirred up inside, and I turned to them, and I said, get behind me, Satan, and get out of here. And immediately they disappeared. And then next thing I know, I found myself down on the riverbank rescuing that person out of that current. And I woke up. And I just felt like God put a burden on my heart that he's called me and he's called us to be rescuers. That there are people all around us that are, that are just being sucked down the current in, in the generation that we live in. And in the generation of our kids. And they're being bombarded. And the enemy, as scripture tells us, he's out to steal and to kill and destroy. But he's called us to rescue and to rescue not just one, but to rescue many. And so I had this incredible vision. And we see here in chapter 12, I want to skip forward to chapter 12. Because we see in this vision, this is what the Lord reveals to Daniel. Chapter 12, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. And this is what it says. Verse 1 says, Then there will be a time of anguish greater than any since nations first came into existence. But at that time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book will be rescued. Now let's pause there for a moment. Okay, what did Daniel, when his when vision started, chapter 10, he said, of war and great hardship. What if you knew what your kids were going to be facing as they're growing up? What would you do differently? They're going to experience, remember Jesus said there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be all kinds of tribulation and great hardship. What are you doing differently that you know that God has already revealed to us about what we go through and what our kids are going to be going through? Because they need to be able to stand strong against all the craziness that the world and the enemy is going to throw at them. And Daniel's revealed here there's going to be anguish that's worse than anything that's ever happened from the time that things began. And he says, but everyone who's, everyone whose name is written in the book, referred to in the book of Revelation, is the book of life who has come to a saving faith in Christ, they will be rescued. All right, let's go on. Verse 2, it goes on. It says, many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will what? They will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. Daniel's got a vision of the resurrection. Okay, hundreds of years before Jesus comes and talks about the resurrection, Daniel's got a vision of the resurrection. Our Lord and Savior is coming back someday to rescue us. The resurrection is real. Our Savior rose and we are going to rise with him. And, and there are some that will go in his glory. But there's some who still need to be rescued. And so we're called to, to mission. We're called, we have a time where we come and worship, but then we've got to take what God has given us 
and go out into the world and change the world and rescue those who are facing a Christless eternity. Verse 3, it says, those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky. And those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. Daniel was praying for and saw you and I today. Because Jesus told his followers, he says, let your light shine before men that they will see your good works and give glory to your father who's in heaven. And we're called to be a light to the world. We're called to be bright lights out in a dark world. Some kids have already gone back to school. Others still are going to be going to school. Some kids are going to be going off to, to college and to grad school. They're going out into a dark world. In a few minutes, at the end, when I wrap up, I want to pray over this generation that they can stand strong, that they can be lights in the midst of a dark world, and that we would have a burden for them and pray for them and see God do incredible things. I really believe that in this room stands some Daniels and some Daniels. Amen? There's going to be some world changers that are right here in this room today. And we're going to pray and we're just going to trust God for that. So we see here that we're to shine as bright lights in the midst of a dark world. God has a vision for us. You are precious to him and God wants to use you to change the world. Last thing number four is this. God is doing more than you understand. Sometimes in the midst of life we grow weary. The Apostle Paul talks about this. He says don't grow weary in times of doing well. But hold on. And sometimes God's at work behind the scenes more than we even realize of what God's doing. And there's some of you that are here today, you've been praying. Maybe you've been praying for your marriage. You're, you're just at a point where you're just ready to give up. Maybe you've been praying for a family member. Maybe you've been praying for your, your kids and it's just been hard. And you've been praying and praying for, for several years and you're just not seeing anything. Well, now we're going to just kind of get a glimpse of what Daniel sees, what God reveals to him in this last section here. Picking up in verse 12. It says, then he said, this angelic being says, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before God. Okay, this is that 30 day, or it's 21 days, three weeks thing he's, he's on. He's praying and fasting. Your request has been heard in heaven. I have come and answered to your prayer. Let's just hold it here a second. Okay, so what, what this person says, this angelic person says, look, Daniel, from the moment, that first time you humbled yourself, you got down on your knees and you began to pray, the answer was on its way. You were heard, and the answer was being sent. All right, let's go on. Verse 13. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now let's pause here again. All right, now here's what's going on. Daniel's given insight into the, into the heavenly realm. All right, remember the apostle Paul, he, he talks about, you know, that our battle is not against each other. It's not against flesh and blood, but how much time we spend, even in the church, arguing and bickering. I mean, you know, God's given us so much, and yet we have a hard time just, you know, loving our spouses and loving our kids and getting along with other people because we're all different and we, we see the world differently. And, and Paul says, look, your battle's not against each other. There's a battle going on in the spirit world. He says our battle is against the principalities in this dark world, these spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly realm. And Daniel's given insight into this. This is what Paul is referring to in the book of Ephesians. And what we see here is that there are, there are demonic forces, fallen angels who are demons. And there are some that are over kingdoms on this earth. There is probably a spirit prince over the, this kingdom of the United States of America. And he is fighting hard to take away our kids, to destroy everything that is sacred of God. Our family, a marriage, our kids. He's coming to steal and kill and destroy and use the information, all the things they have access to, to just, just distort the image of God and what he is like. And we need to have a burden for these kids and love on them and teach them and show them who God is as we model worshiping God and being in his word. And Daniel's revealed here, that, that it's revealed to him that while he is praying, the answer was coming from the day one, but it didn't get there until three weeks later. Or 20, you know, 21 days later, didn't get there. Because there's this battle going on in the heavenly realm. Verse 14. Now I am here to explain what will happen to your people in the future. For this vision concerns a time yet to come. Verse 19. I'm going to skip down. The angelic being says, don't be afraid, he said. 
for you are very precious to God. Peace, be encouraged, be strong. I know some of you have been praying for some things for a long time. And it's important for us to understand that that God, it's not that God's not answering. There is a spiritual battle going on. And sometimes, as Jesus said, you know, the disciple says, what do we got to do? What do we got to do to get a breakthrough? He says, sometimes you got to fast and pray. And I would encourage you just to do a Daniel fast. You know, and just go and just do a time, you know, three weeks of, of just eating vegetables and fruit. Trust me, I've been a vegetarian for, for over 10 years now. It's really not that bad. I'm, I'm really not hurting. <laughs> you know, but just to, just to take just some time and set aside and fast and pray and cry out to God for your marriage, for your kids. Are you praying for your kids? Because our kids are in the middle of a battle beyond what they're experiencing in schools. It's in the heavenly realm. And we want to just trust that God is going to work in their lives and change their lives and just raise up some world changers right here among us to change our community, to change the world, to change marriages, to change families. Amen? So this is what I'd like to do just in closing. I'd like all the parents and their kids that are here this morning, I'd like you all to just bring your kids and come up front here. All right? Just bring all the kids up front here. Because I just want to take a moment and pray over them. All right? I just want to pray for this, this generation and if you are in um, high school, all the, all the grade school kids, high school, middle school, I want you to come up here as well. You can bring your parents up here with you. If you are in college or if you just graduated from college and you are going out into the work world, Caitlin, anybody else, I want you to come up here. I want all these young people up here, all these college students, all right? Because I want to pray over this generation because this generation needs our prayers, just huddle up here. It's okay. We're a family. We can get tight. It's all right if you didn't put lotion on this morning. You stink. It's okay. <laughs> Daniel didn't do it. All right. Let's, let's just all, would you guys just that are sitting out there, just extend your hands forward. Let's just pray for these guys. Lord God, I just thank you for these people, these young people, God. And Daniel just had a burden, God, for the generation after him. He knew that he wasn't going back to Jerusalem. And he knew all the hardship that that next generation was going to go through, all the opposition, and he was shown the spiritual forces of wickedness that were just waging war against his people. And God, we stand before you right now, and we pray for every young person that's here, God, and for their parents, grandparents. God, I just pray that you would encourage them, you would bless them. God, you would empower these young people, God, that, that they would just come to faith in you at a young age and know you, and that you would just raise up Daniels from this group of young people, God. That as they're out in the world, God, they would just shine as bright lights. As they're headed back to school, God, protect them from the schemes of the enemy, the lies of the enemy. Put a shield and a refuge, just be a shield and refuge of them and protect them. Hold them tight, God, and work in them and through them, even at a young age, to be lights to their neighbors, neighbor kids, neighbors around them, friends around them, to change the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. God, we pray your divine power on them. God, that you would raise up warriors in this next generation. Warriors, God, that would just build your church, God, until the day you return. Just bring your kingdom, bring your power, empower each of these kids with the power of your Holy Spirit, God. We cry out to you, God. Forgive us, God, for our shortfalls. As Daniel just confessed his sin and the sins of his people, forgive us, God, for not praying. Forgive us for not being in your word enough. God, help us to lead our kids well. To bring honor to you, to have a clear vision. These kids would know clearly who you are in your power, in your glory, in your majesty. That you are the sovereign God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And there is no other God but you and you alone. Do miracles through these kids. Empower them with your spirit. We pray over them now and their families in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ.